2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I ask you to do the usual with your mobile phones, please? Our first item on the agenda this morning is to take evidence on earnings in Scotland from Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Economy and Fair Work, Victoria Beattie, who is the Head of Workplace Equalities Team, and Simon Fuller, the Deputy Director of Economic Analysis in the Scottish Government. I warmly welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, and I would invite the Cabinet Secretary, if you wish, to make an opening statement. Good morning, Convener. I'm happy to go straight to questions, recognising this as an exploratory subject. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Well, well Cabinet Secretary, our adviser um, has told us that in 2017 and 2018, Scottish average wages grew less quickly than other areas of the UK, and the understanding the causes of that relative Scottish earnings slowdown should be an ongoing priority for us, because obviously potential impacts. I just wonder, are you and the Scottish Government concerned about that potential impact and the relative slowdown um, and the potential impact that might have on the size of your budget? And actually, what measures could you begin to implement to help you respond to it? And the, 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 although these measures are, are, and the levers I recognise might not be uh, significant. Uh, uh, convener, yes, of course we'll want to increase earnings across the um, private and the public sector. We've got a very specific uh, public sector uh, pay policy. And some of the statistical analysis would have shown over the uh, medium term period that the downturn in uh, oil and gas would have been one factor, one significant factor. Um, in terms of uh, economic growth, there's, there's a range of interventions that we're making uh, on my appointment as Economy Secretary. That would include the Economic Action Plan, more around productivity, more around innovation and investment, and what we want to do in, on infrastructure and internationalisation as well. We welcome more investment in research and development. So I think all of that it gives us um, uh, the right kind of approaches to uh, support both public sector and private sector um, enhancement of, of earnings uh, potential. Um, and there'll be further work around retraining, upskilling, and as the economy is transitioning, it clearly is uh, transitioning, make the right interventions to make sure that we're focusing on uh, quality as well as the, the, the quantum. Um, and for reasons that this committee understands better than any other, of course, it has an impact on us in terms of the fiscal framework and the relative position between uh, UK earnings and earnings in Scotland. The key issue in all of this, of course, is productivity, which is why we're very focused on productivity. We heard, we heard from some of the, the contributors at a panel session we had, Cabinet Secretary, about the living wage, and some of, and some of that noise was positive around what the Scottish Government was doing around the, the living wage. But... Um, and although we might be ahead in terms of the number of people who are registering uh, as living wage accredited, um, that's still a very small part of the overall um, work, uh, business background in Scotland. And I just wonder, is there more we can be doing in the arena of the living wage to encourage more employers to be invo uh, involved in a positive way in, in that regard? Absolutely, and having launched the Fair Work Action Plan and supporting the living wage, of course recognising that some of this is reserved, employment laws reserved, and the setting of the, uh, the, the national minimum wage is, is a matter for the uh, UK Government. Um, of course, the Scottish Government was the first uh, government to be accredited with uh, living wage uh, status. Through our uh, procurement policies and, and, and other policies, we've tried to create that culture of expectation. Um, we can't necessarily compel people, but we have tried to create that culture of expectation and encourage it uh, as appropriate. Um, and that includes um, focusing on uh, the business pledge, for example. So it's in terms of uh, uh, private sector practice to try and encourage that. In terms of our own employment policies, we, of course, pay uh, the, the, the living wage, encourage other parts of the public sector to do the same. And recognising that um, encouraging... Uh, as many businesses as possible to pay the living wage. More people are paid the living wage in Scotland than any other part of the UK. That's a good sign. But of course, we want we want to get to 100% and continue to uh, improve that as well. So there are actions by way of encouragement, culture of expectation, and where we can compel in terms of our own um, employment policies. Uh, that's what we've been doing. Recognising that that's the minimum in terms of average, you know, wages. There's more to do across the composition. 
um, of employment, but we've certainly been very proactive around the living wage, and we'll continue um, to look at that. Uh, for example, we are um, a, a reviewing um, small business bonus and in the support of the enterprise agencies, um, a, it's the businesses that they support as well. Uh, we're looking at how they can further support Fair Work First. So, a range of interventions. Um, you, you yourself mentioned the issue of productivity, and I know there are a couple of members who want to get into that area a bit more deeply, Cabinet Secretary. So I'll ask James Kelly to begin that discussion. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I mean, the, the, we heard in the, the last session that the issue around uh, wage growth has been ongoing for some time. You know, for example. The, the average median early earnings are 1.9 per cent below what, what they were in 2009. As, and as you said yourself, um, that that becomes a concern and it feeds into the fiscal forecasts uh, when they're saying there's going to be weak wage growth and that uh, potentially compromises the, the budget. Um, so this is an issue that's been around for a long time. Uh, and as you said yourself, the the reason for it, or one of the reasons for it, is the uh, is to do with weak productivity. So, I'd be interested in your view of what are the <coughs> how, what does the government see as its main task in terms of increasing productivity, and how do you link that into improving wage growth? I think it's a fair analysis. Um, over the period of devolution, actually, productivity in Scotland's improved. So I think we've been closing the gap over the period of devolution, um, and there's been further improvements since 2007 specifically. Uh, not every year has seen big leaps in terms of productivity, but actually 2018 was a much stronger year, and I'm very mindful that in eight minutes' time there'll be further statistics in relation to the last quarter on productivity stats. Uh, as well. But over the period in 2018, there has been improvement. As to what government interventions uh, look like, so we recognise that productivity is an issue um, in terms of output. Uh, and I think that's why some of the uh, interventions I mentioned earlier, that the economy is transitioning. So we want to look at the economy of today and the future. So that's more around digitalisation. We recognise that automation is an issue, but it has positives and opportunities as well in terms of coding and designing and, and, and digital jobs of, of the future. Enhanced productivity uh, can also come from upskilling, um, focusing on quality um, e in manufacturing as well. The, the spend on innovation and research and development is important uh, for industry, and that's why we're supporting the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. It's spending more on our innovation centres, working with universities, education and the economy more widely. and an education system that's clearly focused on skills as well. The retraining partnership will be important as many um, jobs will be changing, so that will focus on productivity. We'll be working with SDDI and productivity clubs because we recognise a lot of the best practice might be in companies and they can share that with other companies. So having that good practice on productivity shared uh, is a key issue. And in strengthening the economic strategy, the four strands of infrastructure, uh, internationalisation, um, inclusive growth and investment um, all will play a part in enhancing um, productivity. And in relation, as I said, to pay earlier on in terms of living wage, what we pay is important too. Um, so focusing on quality is important. So take um, childcare where there's an expectation that we'll pay and encouraged to pay uh, the living wage, we're trying to improve quality. So quality, I think, and productivity go hand in hand. But there's a range of actions in the economic action plan that show that productivity is um, a very serious issue and we want to tackle it. Um, but the signs are that over the period of devolution, we've made progress in narrowing the gap between UK and Scotland. And tw 2018 is a stronger year. Again, oil and gas impact would have impacted on the productivity figures. Um, now there's some... Uh, resurgence uh, there, and that will feed through to the wider economy uh, as well. And as I say, there will be further information on the most recent uh, quarter in terms of productivity. Um, but over the period in 2018, I think we've made progress, so we need to keep that progress up now. Uh, you mentioned technology, which is uh, you know clearly a big advantage. So what are the, the key sectors that you would see technology improvements um, boosting productivity? 
and how do you how do you balance those advances in technology uh, with the, the the fact that there will be automation and it will produce job losses in some areas? And you you would obviously want to have a policy that would counter that way, increasing loss, uh, increasing jobs and opportunities in other areas. So it's a good question, recognising the. Uh, the economy is transitioning. We already know there will be a shortage in digital jobs. So actually, there's great employment opportunities in digital already. But we need to make sure that our workforce is trained and has the necessary accreditation <coughs> and skills to be able to fulfil those jobs, and we can attract more. If you take some of the big, really welcome announcements, say uh, 2,500 jobs at Barclays Bank in Glasgow, 400 jobs at KPMG, for example. And there are, there are other financial institutions right now looking at how they invest in Scotland. They, they will naturally want assurances that we will have the, the people with the appropriate skills to, to populate uh, those, those jobs. So whilst industry will be changing, it, manufacturing is changing, but there are uh, jobs in design, in innovation, in coding, in digital. In, in all of that, and if you look at the investments that we've made through city deals, we're looking to the industries of now and the future. Edinburgh is a good example of the city deal, investing in data, big data, technology, robotics. And so although automation uh, is a challenge in terms of jobs that it displaces, it's also an opportunity in the new jobs it will be creating. And that's why we need to calibrate the necessary um, enterprise and skill system to make sure that we can create as many jobs as possible through that. Of course, it's not lost on this committee that we've got record low unemployment at 3.3% right now, which is outperforming the rest of the UK on 3.9%. Um, and of course, we want unemployment to be as low as possible, employment to be as high as possible, because beneath those figures, uh, there will be issues of, of underemployment um, as well. But And focusing on quality, it is those investments around uh, manufacturing. In terms of the sectoral uh, question, uh, we can do more uh, around um, exports. We launched a new export strategy. Uh, food and drinks are a very successful sector within that. Whiskey uh, is, is an example of, a, of an industry that has really focused on productivity. You know, one of the fastest um, packaging and bottling lines in the world. Um, Shield Hall plant in my own constituency, I was visiting for its 40th um, anniversary, showing that they've invested in productivity and it has sustained high quality, high paid uh, jobs. So um, we want to share that good uh, uh, technical expertise on productivity. So all sectors matter to the Scottish economy, but there is real opportunities in um, uh, life sciences, in uh, production, uh, manufacturing as well. And, and that's why the National Manufacturing Institute um, a, will be so significant for us, and that's government working with the private sector and academia to make those uh, leaps in productivity. So it really is commercialising the, uh, the, the, the academic outputs that, that, that we're investing in and trying to bring all of that together through the enterprise and skill system. You mentioned academic outputs there. I mean, one of the issues I pick up on in speaking to businesses is that there's a bit of a skills gap between the number and the experience of graduates coming out of the system with necessary information technology skills and what you know what business and industry is actually needing what, what the government doing to try and uh, bridge that gap one of the recommendations from the enterprise and skills review was to do just that to make sure that the education system is delivering for what business and industry actually needs and some of that will be around the necessary professional um, or company recognised uh, accreditation. Um, so, for example, in digital, that may well be Microsoft uh, accreditation. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of companies doing fantastic work in Scotland that hide their light under a bushel. You know, they, they, they don't want to shout about their success, partly because of the commercial confidentiality of their clients. But there is a lot of good work uh, going on in Scotland right now. And what businesses have been saying is that you absolutely focus on the skills that are required now and in the future, and digital is a really good example. What government's doing about that is ensuring that we've got the right partnerships between higher and further education eh, and business and industry to make sure that the courses and the um, accreditation, if you like, it can be built in. So foundation and particularly graduate apprenticeships are really important. So if a graduate is going through the education system and getting paid by a company at the same time, um, 
that company uh, is maybe offering the guarantee of a job as well. So that's good for the uh, academic institution, good for the student employee, and good for the company. So in real time, it's giving the uh, it's giving business and industry the skills that they need. It's educating that person, and not necessarily young people, um, because of course uh, there's the apprenticeship opportunities all open to many, not not just young people, but specifically those graduate apprenticeships are giving people the necessary qualifications, accreditation, and pay in their pocket. That seems to be quite good for retaining people in in, in those routes. Um, and they come out work ready because they've been trained in the academic institution at the same time. Sometimes businesses say to me, someone's gone through an academic course and then they become work ready after a period after that. But many of the um, interventions, the recalibration of the system, such as graduate apprenticeships, is getting people work ready as they're going through their education. And I think because Scotland does so well in terms of the population being highly educated, more graduates and most other nations, that's a good thing. Um, they're also ensuring that there's the necessary accreditation professionally recognised or recognised with what business and industry wants is, is a very, very helpful development and that's making a difference to our economy and that's partly why I think some companies are choosing to invest in Scotland uh, right now and is attracting more big companies to come to Scotland because we have that ecosystem of growth and a talented workforce, and there's ways into uh, education. And some of those companies, uh, convener, are, are engaging with colleges and universities to make sure that there's bespoke courses that's right for that sector too, and that's the right kind of partnership to connect with, um, as I say, the, the needs of the education system with uh, the needs of business and industry to give people the best possible start in employment. Willie, did I see you indicate you got a supplementary in this? Okay, thanks very much, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm glad you mentioned the digital economy there, and I don't want to drop us into a Brexit discussion immediately, but the UK government's stated intention is to leave the digital single market, which we think is worth about €400 billion Euros a year throughout the European Union, and Scotland's share of that is roughly about €4 billion Euros per year. What's the impact of that? going to be, do you think, in the Scottish economy, particularly the digital economy, if we get pulled out of that market? I think, Convener, um, I think it's well appreciated that an ideal Brexit in particular would be um, catastrophic for the economy in terms of the wider economic impacts. Uh, I've published the advice of the chief economist in terms of impact on the wider economy, that is recession, GDP contraction, business failure. Um, impact on um, Scotland's finances, um, less exports, and beneath all of that would be that greater stress for companies because there would be a challenge in terms of available staff, investment into universities, research programmes. So I think that full panoply of impacts on the economy would be very sorely felt. So that's why we're trying to avert an ideal Brexit, any form of Brexit impacts on the economy, impacts on individual sectors. I believe we've published the uh, sectoral impact uh, as well. So it will affect our economy adversely as opposed to the growth that we'd be enjoying if there was uh, no Brexit. It, digital would be hit because education's hit, the wider economy's hit, uh, business and industry is impacted. And I think that's partly why um, the digital sector is so concerned about it. Also recognising that digital is an example of an area that's highly mobile you know, in terms of uh, movement of people. So impacting on uh, freedom of movement would also uh, be an issue in terms of employability and available skill, talented workforce, students and research. So for all of those reasons, of course, it would be a negative impact on the economy. Okay. Can I use the link between the digital and, and um, single market and productivity? But this is primarily about pay. So if we can make sure we're talking about it in that context, I think that would be helpful. Angela, I think you wanted to... Yeah, and, and it is, and it is specifically about the link between uh, productivity, growth and uh, pay. Um, and we had a, a wide-ranging discussion um, at our roundtable a few weeks ago. And, and one of our um, witnesses, Russell Gunson, has said, and I'll quote him, he says, we need to focus our productivity policy as much on the everyday parts of the economy as well as on the growth sectors that the Scottish Government has, has picked out. So I'd be interested in the Cabinet Secretary's uh, response uh, to that view 
and also about you know what he considers to be part of the everyday economy um, and you know how does the government demonstrate support for the everyday parts of the economy whatever you consider those to be because it seems to me it's quite easy or easier to demonstrate uh, support and inputs into see you know high growth sectors and it would be good to have a better understanding how the Scottish Government is using its particular levers to support the everyday parts of the economy. Convener, I mean, the badge I'm wearing today is the National Performance Framework underpinned by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and, and that tries to calibrate all the actions of government to focus on uh, our purpose, which is about a you know, flourishing um, a society, realising the opportunities that are there. In terms of the day-to-day, -day, I, I suppose one of the ways to, to, to raise quality is through what you pay, and directly in what we pay for those day-to-day -day services important in terms of paying the living wage, trying to support public sector pay policy that properly remunerates staff, and that in itself can raise quality. Investing in skills is the right thing to do, making sure if there's good practice that that's shared. I suppose an example of big new commitments would include the child care policy and setting out that we want it to uh, be um, uh, paid, uh, all staff to be paid uh, the living wage, and we, we've made the resources available uh, to do that. So in the day-to-day -day spending, the, the biggest spend the government has, of course, is uh, uh, the payment of, of salaries and the remuneration of our staff, and we want that to, to reflect quality and investment um, and good practice as well. So right across government, we're focused on um, good practice, productivity, uh, proper remuneration for the day-to-day -day services. I suppose the reason I focused on the growth opportunity is just there's, a, there's great potential to create high-quality jobs in those, partly to replace um, that which m might no longer be there. Uh, and as an example of, um, in terms of day-to-day, -day, within the private sector, of course, the announcement that Michelin would be leaving Scotland is a good example where there won't be that same industrial manufacturing at that site in Dundee anymore. And that's why we were working very proactively with the company around what are the opportunities for employment now and into the future? Where's the entrepreneurship? How can we support transition to the circular economy, the low carbon uh, economy? And how can, how can we create those jobs through our investments, our partnership approach? And one of the reasons Michelin agreed to stay and help us with that exercise was our vision for the country, and that was the national performance framework. So I think we set out our vision for the country, the investments that we're willing to make, the outcomes that we're focused on, which cut across portfolios, and, um, and make sure there's the right investments through um, the gender uh, pay gap, through fair work first, through what our enterprise companies are doing, create the right culture um, to approach that, whether it is the, the businesses and the um, services of the day, and then where the opportunities are into the future. So if I could just pick up um, a few, few further things, particularly about how we actually improve productivity in uh, the service sector, and I'm thinking about services specifically to uh, people, particularly the care sector, whether it's older people and the cabinet secretaries uh, mentioned uh, childcare as well. So while the, the digital services is a, a, an enabling <coughs> sector as well as a sector in their own right and you know up upskilling staff, there is something um, quite distinct about productivity and what improving productivity means in people orientated <laughs> services it's not you know quite the same as you know improving productivity in a big manufacturing um, sector you know it means something different and it has to be uh, measured differently so it would be you know good to understand um, that more um, particularly given um, that the government has a very clear commitment to reducing the gender pay gap and in terms of the care sector of course it's predominantly predominantly women. That came through very strongly in our evidence tape se session uh, cabinet secretary and particularly in that care sector as Angela describes the challenge of increasing productivity at the same time particularly in the third sector element of the, the care sector how they can match the, 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 the living wage elements in, in that and it was a challenge for them to drive that productivity at the same time and find the wage levels that, that they need. So there was, that came through as a, as a theme. I suppose the health secretary or community secretary would be better placed to go into some of the forensic detail of that. But for my interests of or decisions by way of finance secretary, in terms of that uh, 
one of the intervention makes a difference, like telecare. It, so that's the appropriate use of digital technology can enhance care and then has an impact for staff. Where it comes up in finance, arguably, is where the third sector describes the pressures that can be put upon them to drive that efficiency with the same contracts and the same money, whilst at the same time there's more pressure on them to pay the living wage because we want the quality as well. So in terms of the, the finance interest, there is something making sure that the money that's in the system, because there is health and social care integration uh, and specifically uh, identified resources for payment of the living wage to local government, for example, on childcare and in social care, um, there was an uplift to pay for that, making sure that that then follows through to the third sector as well is important because they need to be resourced to pay for that quality. And I think that's a fair issue in terms of how we how we ensure that the resources are there. But that takes you back to the debate on ring fencing that this committee has often had, whether we should ring fence uh, resources that are earmarked for such a cause uh, at a local level. Many third sector organisations ask the government to ring fence resources so that they're guaranteed to receive that resource. Of course, local government resists that because they prefer the general um, payment. So we're supportive of the agenda, but there is a question mark as to how much we should ring fence when we've even clearly identified the resource to achieve the policy outcomes, such as payment of living wage within the social care sector. And, and, and Tom, I know you want in, but it's quite a number of SNP voices in a row. So I'm going to do. It's not a bad thing necessarily. Well, <laughs> I need to try and keep a balance. But so I'll let you do a quick supplementary, and then I'm going to move on to others. So. Thank you, convener, and good morning, cabinet secretary. It's just a very brief supplementary. You touched upon the jobs of the future. Um, recently, of course, the first minister has declared a climate emergency, and this will precipitate a review of all policies across government. Now, clearly, where our first priority is to, to meet these targets and to meet that target by 2045, this is going to uh, generate a, a range of different areas for innovation, entrepreneurship, both in policy but and across a whole range of areas in ecology, rewilding, conservation and, of course, green energy. Now, while Scotland by itself can't solve the climate crisis, it can, of course, be a, a pioneer and develop and innovate and export that across the world. So while obviously we're meeting this environmental challenge, there's clearly economic opportunities as well. How do you think we can capitalise upon that in Scotland and innovate and develop the technologies which will help us to meet these climate change goals and to capitalise economically as well? The Environment Secretary will return to Parliament with um, more to say in relation to the uh, Committee on Climate Change uh, report and the need to look, of course, at our, our policies to respond to even more ambitious um, climate targets. And Scotland's got a good track record, of course, of reducing emissions, and we've got the most ambitious climate targets uh, in the world. And, of course, that requires us to look at our policies and our actions. But there is, of course, economic opportunity uh, in these policies as well. And I just gave an example of Michelin and Dundee, so they're uh, not continuing with their industrial tyre manufacturing, but they want to continue to have a presence in Scotland when we express what we want to do around the circular economy, around low carbon transport and around entrepreneurship uh, in that regard. So there is absolutely agree with uh, Mr Arthur on the economic opportunities from uh, this agenda and we should seize them and that's why we have been uh, investing um, directly into policies that will make a difference in carbon uh, uh, emissions uh, reductions, uh, but also where the opportunities of the future will come. For example, renewables. As it happens last week, uh, last uh, Thursday, uh, I convened uh, a summit with uh, those um, many of those companies and interested stakeholders interested in renewables, particularly offshore renewables, because there is a view that whilst we have been consenting and encouraging and enhancing our capacity within the renewable sector, we've not had the onshore industrial jobs that should come along with that. Uh, even though the UK government has shared uh, that ambition, uh, we have not got the jobs that we would like to, uh, to have seen. Uh, so we're looking at ways we can use our uh, uh, levers to encourage companies to invest in supply chain and in and the industrial jobs in Scotland that then match uh, the renewables um, capacity that we have been uh, delivering. So I think it's a good example of where ambitious climate change um, uh, targets, um, 
creating jobs and employment and economic opportunity all goes hand in hand. But as I say, on the wider issue about a response to the uh, Committee on Climate Change, the Environment Secretary will return to Parliament uh, shortly. Patrick, we can now I think, get into your area of public sector pay. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, on, uh, on public sector pay, when uh, you uh, announced the, uh, the public sector pay policy in December, Cabinet Secretary, uh, you said that it continues the journey of restoration of public sector pay. Uh, can you describe that journey, how far we're going to get and how quickly? I can't set out future budgets or what percentage increase that there, there might be in future budgets. But what we've departed from is the 1% pay cap. And there is divergence in terms of UK policy and Scottish Government policy. If we had gone much further in terms of an uplift in pay, it probably would have been impacted on actual headcount. So we've tried to um, retain as many people as possible, uh, protect protect numbers and ab absolute headcount uh, in giving as fair a remuneration as possible within the bounds of affordability. And we've also had a policy of no compulsory redundancies. We've targeted uh, low pay in terms of payment of the living wage, <coughs> cash underpin. Uh, we've maintained progression, which is quite significant because that's sometimes lost within the headline figure of a pay increase, but actually progression is important to those that are benefiting from the incremental increases in their pay. Um, we've suspended bonuses, so um, in terms of UK government continuing to pay bonuses, we've not been doing that, um, as a matter of course within Scottish Government public sector pay policy, and there's further flexibilities that allow uh, employers within the public sector to target inequalities and equalities issues um, as well. So I think all that as a package has been a departure from UK policy, has tried to respond to the issues around remunerating our staff. Um, in terms of, for the last two uh, years, the uh, public sector pay policy targeting a higher uplift to those paid less, so £36,500 uh, being the limit of difference between a 2% and 3% pay policy, and a cap at the top as well. In terms of the journey of restoration, Having moved away from the public sector pay cap of uh, 1%, what we've tried to do is increase that uplift, but within the bounds of affordability, uh, so that we're not reducing the headcount. So it has been a very careful balancing act. Um, mindful of the inflationary um, uh, position, CPI and uh, RPI, many people would have had an uh, above inflation increase when you take all of that uh, together. So journey, journey of restoration looks like uh, fair remuneration, uh, but the percentage at which we can increase it will be dependent upon the budgets at the time and decisions that we make around headcount. Completely, that there is a departure from UK policy, uh, and I think it's a, a welcome departure. Uh, I'm questioning whether the, the phrase journey of restoration of public sector pay is strictly accurate. It would be wrong to give a false expectation people working in the public sector. Do you accept that public sector pay in Scotland remains lower than it was in real terms 10 years ago? A, yes, as a consequence of the recession and UK austerity, um, clearly we'd want to go further. But equally, I don't want to make people compulsarily redundant. And I think it's fair to say there has been a trade-off in maintaining headcount mm -hmm. and not making people redundant. So we've been employing more people uh, whilst there has been a pay restraint that I think is uh, well understood. I think there's been pay restraint in the private sector as well, but for the public sector, we've been trying to protect the workforce, and that journey of restoration is uh, departing from the 1% pay cap, uh, looking at inflation when we're making decisions around public sector pay policy. And as I say, for the last two years of the public sector pay policy, have that differential of 3% and 2% which, of course, is more than 1%. Within that, for sectoral bargaining, bargaining arrangements as well, clearly different categories of workers have had uh, different pay awards. And there's a difference, of course, between um, uh, just because of timing and when the negotiations would have happened and the, and the character of those uh, negotiations, different pay awards for different um, members of staff. But in terms of our overall pay policy, it's departed from the pay cap, which was down to the, straight, the restraint necessary for the time. 
and the the balance that you described between a headcount and uh, and above inflation pay settlements that's something that that's been debated throughout that whole decade and more in fact when 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 John Swinney uh, your predecessor was trying to figure out how to respond to, to the, the economic crisis and the, the impact that was having on, on Scottish public finances. He brought all the political parties together and there was consensus at that point that we didn't want to see lots of redundancies in the public sector and that pay restraint was unfortunately going to have to be something that, that people would live with for a time. We've now moved beyond that and we're at a point where the, the loss of public sector pay uh, has become intolerable and unacceptable. Uh, and I think the fact that some unions, for example, teaching unions, have had to work so hard to get a, 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 the, the beginnings of restoration in the value of, of, of pay uh, shows that. Would you accept that if this phrase, journey of restoration of public sector pay, is going to be an accurate description to people working in the public sector of what they can expect, then it has to mean a sustained period of above inflation pay increases across the board, not just for particular sectors. I don't want to attach a definition to it, convener, but I understand the sentiment of the question. And we want remuneration that's fair, that's affordable, that does protect headcount. I mean, arguably, there could be a totally different approach where we have fewer people, but we pay them much more. But the balance that we've taken is in executing the government's responsibilities that we properly remunerate our staff, recognise issues of low pay. And I think that is well recognised, the efforts we've made around low pay uh, generally. Uh, and in terms of the pay differential, capping increases at the top, not paying out bonuses. And so I think it's a range of interventions that I've given as a much fairer pay policy. I understand the sentiment of the question. I don't wish to attach a definition to it other than it working through the, the pay agreements that we've made with our staff and will continue to do in light uh, of the financial circumstances uh, that we face. But I think we enjoy relatively good relations with trade unions as we engage with them on pay going forward, and I'll continue to do that. Finally on this, there was some discussion at the round table uh, recently that we had on this, um, this topic about the indirect effect of the public sector pay policy, uh, not just the Scottish governments, but local government as well. What, what is the effect on the wider uh, earnings uh, situation in, in Scotland, uh, the, the, the impact on the, the private sector? There was some discussion about are there ways in which the government or the public sector more generally can maximise the, the impact uh, that public sector pay has on the rest of the economy, particularly given that some of the sectors where poverty pay is most severe uh, are those where issues like procurement are less relevant, things like retail uh, and hospitality. Are there things that the government and the public sector can do to maximise the impact that public sector pay policy has on the wider economy? It can be, you know, it's a very fair question. And looking at some of the evidence, I think there is an issue about, frankly, how much the public sector pays then does have an impact on what the private sector pays, because there will be competition uh, for people. Now, low unemployment is a good thing. I'm sure we'd all <coughs> agree on that. But uh, there is an issue about availability of people as well, skills. And so what we pay in public sector pay policy will have an indirect impact on private sector pay policy. And that culture of expectation or raising of quality around the living wage is significant. I think our efforts, whether it's through accreditation, campaigning, payment on the living wage, um, are probably one of the reasons why there are more people paid the living wage in Scotland than any other part of the UK. And that's quite significant when you also think about the composition of the rest of the UK economy, and particularly the uh, stratification of the composition of, of the London, the city of London um, uh, economy. So I think the practice we engage in in public sector pay policy does have an impact in, in private sector uh, also and specifically around rates of pay and uplift, I think that that will have uh, an impact. Um, and we have tried to show leadership in our public sector pay policy and how we tackle equalities issues, how we tackle low pay, uh, and how we've also tried to ensure employment through our policy of no compulsory redundancies. Murdo. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've also got a question around public sector pay policy. We've seen recently, as, as I think you, you acknowledged just a, a few moments ago, different sectoral agreements. So, for example, we saw uh, teachers getting quite a, a, a generous settlement, I think it was 9 plus 3 per cent. Mrs. Fraser is a teacher, so I'm not complaining about that for the avoidance of doubt. But at the <laughs> same time, we see um, 
for example, further education college lecturers who would regard themselves in a very similar place in terms of the, the service they provide, who have been taking industrial action around the pay settlement that's being offered to them. So there's quite a disparity. And I suppose my question, therefore, is, you know, do you really have a public sector pay policy, or are you just making it up as you go along? Um, there is an established public sector pay policy which acts as a guide uh, in terms of public sector pay policy. Uh, each um, trade union, each sector, each segmentation of staff is entitled to engage with the employer, part of government, part of the public sector as appropriate. Uh, and that's why there can be departure from the public sector pay policy. But it is a, it is a guide. It is progressive and fair uh, and affordable. Uh, and there'll be um, those parts of the public sector uh, that uh, have adhered more closely to it because of the nature of negotiations. Uh, others will have a, have a different arrangement. But I very much see the public sector pay policy as a benchmark. Uh, set, it out as the, set it out of the budget, as I, as I have done uh, every year. Uh, but uh, trade unions and uh, employees still have the right to negotiate with their employer um, to depart from it. But all the measures in terms of low pay, equalities and proper remuneration is what I expect to, to be delivered by uh, public sector employers. And many look to it as the guide, um, but that isn't the final say on pay. So uh, what you seem to be saying, therefore, is that sectors which are, are, are better negotiators <coughs> Uh, are able to get better deals and therefore you know, break or at least push the boundaries of your policy. I, I wonder if you can therefore appreciate the frustration currently felt by, for example, further education college lecturers who are not being offered a deal anything like as generous as the one that's just been given to teachers. Of course, the language that Mr Fraser used was not the language uh, that I used uh, at all. Um, pay negotiations are undertaken based on the circumstances, based on the history, based on uh, uh, issues of delivery of service, transformation. The issue around uh, teachers' pay, uh, for example, is a recognition um, of education as a priority for the government. There's a recognition of the transformation that's going on uh, within uh, education, the empowerment of teachers, uh, uh, the skills issues. So, so there was a lot in those negotiations. So we do look at the, uh, the issues each cabinet secretary that will lead with it, uh, for pay and their own uh, portfolios. It will look at those issues to then arrive at a conclusion on pay. But the public sector pay policy is a guide, and each um, a category of staff, segmentation, of course, is entitled to negotiate uh, that, and, and that's what's been happening. So the uh, different pay awards will come down to the negotiations uh, at the time and the information, the pay claim that's put, off, put forward by uh, the representatives of the employees, and then we conduct those um, negotiations. But I would say again that the public sector pay policy is a very um, strong guide to that and absolutely sets um, the position of the government out. Okay, well, it sounds like more of a muddle to me than a policy, but thank you for answering my questions. Okay, and thank you for your comment, Murda. Uh, Emma. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I'm interested in wages in rural areas. So in, in, in my region, it's one of the lowest paid in the south of Scotland. Some of the salary is more than two pounds difference, uh, lower than average in Scotland. Um, and I've been, when I looked at rural wages, the first thing that comes up when you Google it is farmers and agriculture. But there's more than farmers and agricultural workers in rural Scotland. Uh, there's one woman, one man, micro businesses, small businesses, and uh, I'm interested to hear about you know the challenges of the cost of living in rural areas. Transport's an issue. There's been food pricing comparisons done by the citizens' advice across the Fries and Galloway, looking at massive differences in grocery baskets um, from main supermarkets. So I'm interested to hear about the what can be done, what is being done to support rural wages and growth and all of that. Fergus Ewing, of course, leads on a rural uh, economy and the Cabinet has been uh, given recommendations by the Council and Rural Advisors and much of that was about the um, a vibrancy and the ability for rural Scotland to, to realise the opportunities that will be there through economic growth, entrepreneurship, building the infrastructure that can unlock the potential of rural areas in Scotland. I know that the point was made 
about farmers, but that's one of the reasons that uh, ensuring that, that loan arrangements were in place so that farmers who were receiving uh, CAP payments were able to benefit from even earlier payments through the loans arrangement system, because recognising uh, what farmers are, in, are contributing to the economy runs right through the supply chain. So actually ensuring that those um, uh, loan payments were in place and then the CAP payments is good for the, the rural economy, We're about half a billion pounds, of course, investment into the, the rural economy. Uh, the enterprise agencies have been working in rural areas, whether that's High uh, or Scottish Enterprise, currently operating in south of Scotland. Um, and in south of Scotland, of course, we'll have the new enterprise uh, body that will invest in employment opportunities in a sustainable way uh, into the future. And then there's the other wider investments into the rural economy that will make a difference in terms of uh, infrastructure, education, or even the public sector pay policy that's supporting um, um, public sector pay in rural areas as well, recognising that can have a disproportionately positive impact. Uh, issues like small business bonus, so other tax levers have been helpful here, helping small towns and villages survive the... Um, uh, uh, the last recession, some difficult times in terms of our town and village centres. So other tax support, I think, has encouraged those entrepreneurs, smaller businesses in rural areas that benefit, for example, from the small business bonus. So I think there's a range of interventions that have supported rural communities, and there's, there's more that we can do in that regard, and that's why we're engaging uh, with the Council of Rural Advisors. OK. Just a... It's just another. Are we sub? Um, Apologies. I looked at. I found it really difficult to get the number of living wage employers in Dumfries and Galloway, and 20 are registered. But I'm sure there's more than 20. So again, what can we do to encourage living wage employers to register that they're living wage employers, so that you know the maybe Dumfries and Galloway could be seen as not the lowest in living wage employers? Well, many businesses in Scotland will probably be fulfilling all the criteria for Scotland's business pledge, but don't necessarily seek the accreditation to, to get the credit for doing that. The same goes for the living wage, that not every employer that's paying the living wage might seek the living wage accreditation that they should. So I'll give that further thought as to how we might be able to enhance the recording and reporting of, of employers that are doing it. But again, that, that may be largely for the private sector to be encouraged to, uh, to, to showcase that companies are actually delivering it and might want to get the credit of the accreditation uh, for so doing. So I'll give that further thought in terms of how we could try and capture that figure more fully. Neil? We just discussed the role of trade unions in, <coughs> in um, negotiating different uh, settlements in different sectors. I just wanted to ask you about in terms of the role trade unions can play in driving economic policy, productivity growth, wage growth. So, for example, the Council of Economic Advisors, which I presume is one of the main advisory bodies to the government on, on these issues, uh, to my understanding, doesn't have any representation from the trade union movement. Do you not think we should actually have, if we're serious about wage growth, if we're serious about productivity growth, actually have a meaningful partnership at the highest level of government between industry and labour to drive this forward? I understand the question that uh, um, Neil Bibby is asking about representation there, uh, but the trade unions have direct access to government through the range of meetings we have with them. We have regular meetings with the STUC. Uh, cabinet secretaries regularly meet with the trade unions within their portfolio. I regularly meet with uh, civil service trade unions and alongside the First Minister regularly meet um, SUC on an issue by issue basis, basis we do. So don't think for a minute because there isn't a trade union designated representative on the Council of Economic Advisors. They're not engaging in our economic <coughs> policy and advice because they are. Whether that's on pay, whether that's on the economic strategy or whether that's engaging directly with the highest level of Scottish Government. Um, trade unions, they say, we have biannual arrangements and we have other regular meetings with cabinet secretaries, but there are arrangements for the trade unions to meet directly with the first minister and cabinet secretaries as, as appropriate. So there is that regular feed I, into our policy. I appreciate what you're saying there, but on the one hand, you're saying we're meeting with the trade unions over here and we're meeting with the council of economic advisors here. And what I'm suggesting is, do, you know, do we not need an actual proper partnership between government trade unions and labour and industry and economic advisors to actually drive this forward in terms of wages, uh, wage growth and economic growth. Because I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about engaging, but do we not actually need to um, get everyone in the same room at the same time to, draw, to drive this forward, rather than meeting people on different, different occasions to discuss different things? I, I conceded that I understand the rationale for the question, but probably more important, 
as to who's in which meeting is do we engage with the trade unions? And the answer to that is yes. Do we actually say engagement with trade unions as employer is a good thing? The answer to that is yes. We say so in the Fair Work Nation policies. We say so in the Fair Work agenda that was wholeheartedly welcomed by the trade unions. So there are many, there are many forums in which we engage with trade unions. There are many ways in which they have sh shaped and contribute to our economic policy. I again, understand you know, the request for representation there. That's not a request that I'm aware of having been made by the S2UC, um, because there is established, well-established arrangements for engaging with Scotland's trade unions, uh, which I think has led to a good relationship. If you look at the difference in relationship between UK government and the trade unions and Scottish government and the trade unions, then I think we have channels of communication, we have appropriate forum in which to discuss matters of interest to employees and to wider economic strategy, and that's been satisfactory. Um, and through the, even more importantly than the meetings, through our actions, we have shown that we have been able to take the trade unions' views on board, and not least in our uh, employment policies, uh, in as much as are devolved uh, to Scotland in our economic strategy, in a fair work agenda, uh, a fair work convention, and our wider policies. One of the areas that came up and as part of the round table discussion, I think we, we need to make sure we put on the record was the issue the gender pay gap. Yeah. Uh, and we heard evidence that the gender pay gap had been falling re uh, reasonably quickly until about 2011, but the gap had closed relatively more slowly since then. So I just wonder what, in your view, and that what action might be, uh, levers might be available to the Scottish Government to help address this issue? Well, again, recognising that many of the um, legislative levers are in Westminster, but by our policy actions, we've outlined the uh, uh, Gender Action Plan, um, and that is around um, employment. It is about addressing the gap, recognising that progress um, has been made. Uh, we have narrowed that. Um, we did publish on um, International Women's Day on the 8th of March the Fair of Scotland for Women, the Gender Pay Gap uh, Action Plan, and it covers the range of cross-governmental approaches that were taken to tackle that inequality that women face uh, within the labour market. Of course, there are um, issues of, of discrimination and inequality that we're tackling, um, but as I say, I can, I can revisit um, the strategy and, and um, present it to committee if you want the detailed actions uh, within it that we've outlined um, and Jamie Hepburn is the appropriate minister that leads on this specifically in his task with seeing the uh, um, action plan through. I think in that area whether it's either yourself or, or Jamie Hepburn I think it would be useful to get further information from okay. the government on exactly what they're doing so we can make a, any considerations that we have as full okay. as possible. Any other questions from any of my colleagues? In which case uh, can I thank the witnesses for their time and the Cabinet Secretary for his contribution and discussion and the questions also. I should thank my members for, for, for their questions. I now suspend this meeting just for a few minutes uh, to allow a changeover of witnesses.
OK, colleagues, our next item is to take evidence on Scottish VAT assignment from Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Economy and Fair Work, for Jonathan Sewell, who is the Head of Income Tax and Tax Strategies Unit in the Scottish Government, and Ian Pearce, who is the Economic Advisor in the Scottish Government. Uh, I welcome our witnesses to the meeting, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary, if he so wishes, to make an opening statement. Cabinet right. Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener. Again, I'm uh, very mindful that the uh, uh, committee is exploring this issue and looking at, at the evidence as we are continuing to, to work it through with uh, the UK government. And uh, officials are d doing their best to try and uh, arrive at a situation where we are confident in the uh, methodology. I should say in that regard, though, even though discussions with the UK government are ongoing, and I've raised it most recently with uh, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, I think a lot of the issues around the, the volatility, the question marks uh, around Brexit, around the, the, the numbers, the margin of error that we're dealing with, we'll never have an outturn statement, so it is based on estimates. But as we are exploring this, uh, I have raised my concerns with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, because to continue, we would need to sign off of the Joint Exchequer Committee, where UK Government and Scottish Government uh, agree. Uh, but, but as we're working through all these issues, I am increasingly minded uh, to postpone VAT assignment until VAT powers can be further discussed at the time of the Fiscal Framework Review to give both governments time to assess the robustness of the model and understand the impact of EU exit. I'm very happy to explore that with the committee this morning for the reasons of my concern around uh, what this may do to the Scottish budget, and that's something I'm very happy to explore. OK. Well, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Obviously, that's a, sub it's a substantial move to say you're considering um, postponing uh, VAT assignment. But we, still, we still have to go through the process today to make sure in that decision-making, if that's what you finally come to, that we um, understand some of the dynamics behind it uh, and some of the challenges that might lead you to that mm. that uh, position. Therefore, um, I think the evidence taken we do this morning should just be on the same basis of being as robust as we can on the process to enable you to come to whatever conclusions you're going to eventually come to. Mm. But thank you for informing the committee of that. Uh, and as you know, one of the major challenges in assignment of VAT unlike the other taxes, as you mentioned yourself, will never be that outturn data. Uh, as a result, um, assigned Scottish VAT will need to be estimated. That introduces, as you said yourself, the other, another layer of that volatility. So to, to what extent do you think that volatility could be mitigated if the, whenever VAT uh, is finally assigned? Um, and is, is that volatility? Can you explain a bit more how that, why that's beginning to drive your thinking in this area? I, I think it, one of my concerns is because it's based on survey data and it's based on ethod, eh, 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 estimates. We'll never have the outturn data. And because it's one set of estimates against another set of estimates, unlike income tax, for example, it won't be reconciled. And the margin of error for both could be such that we could be either positive or negative because of the margin of error of both, which doesn't give us the certainty. If we were, for example, having to take money out of the budget or use our borrowing powers or reserves, whatever it happens to be, uh, to address, say, if there was, a, if there was less revenue, then, then that would impact us uh, financially. Um, and it's that concern around the accuracy that gives me the concern here in the approach recognising that this is almost you know, £6 billion pounds of revenue. So not being certain on the accuracy of the approach does concern me. In terms of timescale for what could resolve this, I think if recognising we're in the trans transition period at the moment, if we had more time, we could look at the data and the surveys and the estimates. We'd have more information to go on. We don't have that right now. And added to the uncertainty right now is uh, the Brexit, potential Brexit impact as well. So that'll hit the economy, consumption and VAT receipts. And we don't know if that would be disproportionate um, to Scotland. It's the lack of data right now that I think is an issue. Coming through this period of uncertainty just carries risk that uh, I'm not convinced we should be carrying, recognising that on VAT it's assignation and not a power. So we can't push and pull levers 
to make a difference in relation to VAT income, um, but it would be that assignation. So it's the level of risk that I'm concerned about and the consequent impact on how we would uh, address any negative impact through the block grant adjustment that all members are familiar with uh, and the lack of policy levers. So we do want to see this power devolved, but it's not a devolved power as it stands right now because it's assignation, but it's assignation that carries a disproportionate risk because of that uncertainty and the lack of data. Having boosted data samples, we'll have more data, uh, and I think um, being able to discuss this more fully in the review of the fiscal framework, and it could be a power, not assignation, but we would have more data in which we could make an informed judgment. That's the kind of position I've expressed to the Chief Secretary. Uh, effectively, what you're saying is that in terms of in, the modelling it goes on, you would need to see that over a longer period of time to see if the risks can be mitigated and what the actual trends and flows might be in that process. Absolutely. So even though it would still be based on survey data, at least we would have had that assessment over a period of time, taking into <laughs> account uh, the Brexit uncertainty we're facing at the moment. So heading into what might be an impact in the economy, volatility, added uncertainty, it, based on concerns around the level of accuracy at the moment, doesn't feel that we're in a position to sign this off. Adam. Um, thank you, Convener, and, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think this is worth exploring in, in, in some, some detail, and, and we're, we're talking about a lot of things at once here. So I wonder if we could just kind of pass it a little bit and separate out exactly you know, where, where the concerns are, and in particular this. How much of this, how much of your current position that you wish to postpone this or delay it is is associated with Brexit uncertainty and how much of it would have been the case regardless um, of, of Brexit. So perhaps we can put Brexit to one side for a minute. I want to come back to it in a minute, but if we just put, put, put it to one side for a second and, and, and let me ask you this. Notwithstanding Brexit, given that there never can, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, there, there never can be outturn data, so there never can be a reconciliation process. Was this doomed to fail from the beginning? I think it was, a very, I think it was very difficult um, because it was only ever assignation rather than the power being devolved. Many people perceive it as a power devolved to Scotland. You know, Scotland will be in control of uh, VAT. Well, we won't, but it, it, I think it was always challenging as assignation. But what we need for assignation even to proceed is confidence in the accuracy of the estimates to truly reflect what's going on in the Scottish economy. In, in, indeed. Can, sorry, can, sorry to cut across. Is, is that possible? I mean, are, are we, I mean, we all agree that we would want to have confidence in the estimates. My question is, is it possible to have confidence in the estimates, given that you, you, you and your officials, the UK government and its officials, have spent two years or more working on the methodology of you know, trying to you know, nail down these estimates so that we're not just um, you know, talking, so, so it's not just guesswork. Mm. Uh, and the, the question I have for you is, you know, notwithstanding the Brexit uncertainty, which I'll come to in a second, I, I, is that possible? Is it, is it, is it doable? Having already agreed to boost the data, it still doesn't address the issue of accuracy. So I have two uh, very well-educated officials here who might want to offer a view on whether we can fix this with even more data, but I fear not. I fear that because it's survey on survey, right. estimate on estimate, the accuracy issue is what's very difficult to overcome. Okay. And we as politicians and as parliament, because this is about Parliament's powers, not just government, yeah. make a decision on what level of risk we wish to carry. And the level of risk that's been identified at the moment hasn't been overcome, even with boosted data, even with the best will in the world, even with the cooperation of civil servants. No, the answer is we have not found a way that addresses that issue of risk, which, which we'll return to, is compounded by Brexit yeah. uncertainty. So just to, just to be absolutely clear on this, notwithstanding Brexit, the Scottish Government's position is that the risks associated with the assignment of VAT are so uncertain, um, because we are only talking about estimates and estimates, we're only talking about survey data and there's no outturn data, that this, that this could not be done to the satisfaction of the Scottish Government, irrespective of Brexit. So what we signed up to in the Smith Agreement, as I understand it, is that there has to be joint sign-off to the process of assignation, and that's what we've not identified yet, the system that gives us confidence in the accuracy of the assignation. That hasn't been identified yet. 
and civil servants haven't yet identified a system that can deliver that level of accuracy as the position. Okay, that's so we, we do still wish to take on the power, of course, recognising it's not a power, it's assignation. Yeah. But as it stands at the moment, the level of risk is such uh, that we're not in a position to sign this no, off. No, the, the, re the reason why, of course, that the Smith Commission unanimously recommended that there could be no devolution of powers with regard to rates or exemptions of VAT is because such recommendation would be illegal. Um, it would contra be contrary to European law. European law, as I understand it, um, prohibits and more than one uh, rate of consumption or sales or value-added tax in a member state. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, it's not, just to be clear, I mean, it's not that the United Kingdom government is saying, no, we're not going to devolve, mm. it's that European Union law, when we still continue to be bound by European Union law, um, uh, makes, it, makes it illegal. Is that, is, that, is that a correct analysis? That was correct at the time, yeah. Okay. So the, um, the position of the Scottish government is that one of the advantages of Brexit is that the, it, it now becomes possible to think about the devolution of VAT rather than the mere assignment of VAT. This is possible only if the United Kingdom leaves the, Europe, the European Union. Uh, Mr Tompkins is at least accurate in the proposition he's putting forward. It's still not a compelling reason for the Scottish Government to support Brexit nonetheless and wouldn't change my vote uh, on voting to remain within the European Union. But it is true to say, uh, as Mr Tompkins has described, uh, that the UK government now has choices, uh, well, may well have choices in terms of that uh, different uh, legal position, yeah. and could um, devolve the power if they so wished, which okay. they couldn't have done within the previous arrangement. So that's an accurate um, position, but as I say, in itself is not a good reason no, no, to indeed, support indeed. Brexit. Okay, can, can I come to what you said about Brexit earlier in your um, re remarks to the, to the Communion Cabinet Secretary? This is my, this is my la last question on this for the time being. Uh, you, you said that um, the Brexit uncertainty... Um, might uh, have an, uh, uh, an impact on consumption and might have a disproportionate impact on consumption in Scotland that would, I take it from your tone, be adverse to the, um, uh, to the revenue stream that would accrue to the Scottish Government under any methodology for calculating um, uh, uh, VAT assignment. What's the evidence that supports the um, fear um, that uh, any Brexit impact on consumption would be disproportionate in Scotland? It, because of the nature of VAT that's paid in Scotland, I don't know if either of the think, officials want to I think there's, there's two aspects around Brexit and VAT. Firstly, there's the question about disproportionate impact in Scotland. If we, obviously, as you know, the majority of VAT is paid by the household sector. So based on, for example, the Consumer Sentiment Index, which is published by the Scottish Government, uh, there appears to be a larger impact on household confidence in Scotland relative to the rest of the UK, which appears to be associated with Brexit. So there does seem to be a larger effect that has happened in Scottish households relative to the rest of the UK. I think there's also a second question around Brexit uncertainty of VAT, which is the fact that, as has been discussed, VAT is to a degree a harmonised EU-wide tax, and therefore the collection of VAT and the paperwork systems are designed in such a way that they don't distinguish between import VAT from the EU and import VAT from the rest of the world. And therefore, at the moment, as far as I'm aware, new paperwork isn't necessarily in place to collect VAT, depending on how we were to leave the EU. So there are risks on going around the collection of VAT and how it would be collected post-EU, which means that 1920 as a base year uh, becomes very uncertain. And how the um, how the impact of Brexit would be disproportionate in Scotland with regard to the rest of the United Kingdom, which is the, which is the issue, right. which is the issue well, I think here. Obviously, household spending is one of the largest components of driving VAT and driving the economy in general. And if Brexit has a larger effect on household confidence in Scotland, um, why would it? Well, obviously, households in Scotland uh, have a slightly different preference potentially around Brexit. They voted slightly differently um, to households in the rest of the UK in the referendum. Therefore, they may be more risk averse around the impact of Brexit would have on their personal finances, which would lead them to save more and spend less. So there are a number of channels by which Brexit could... So, hang on. So, so do, do, would, you see, would you expect to see the same effect, therefore, in London, which also voted heavily to, re to remain? I mean, are you seriously suggesting that parts of the United Kingdom that voted to remain are going to lower their consumption after Brexit w compared with parts of the United Kingdom that voted leave? Is that the position of the Scottish Government? It's not the position of the Scottish Government. I think what there is is evidence to suggest that households have already changed their behaviour to a degree, if you look at the household survey data, about how they are responding to what they perceive as future risks to their income. 
Yeah. Obviously, depending on how you view your future rest of your income, you might change your spending patterns. On average, Scottish households have a discernibly different approach to their future risks than, on average, households in the rest of the UK. And that risk could therefore crystallise in future in different spending patterns. Okay. And convener, if I can return to it again to be helpful, it's, it's a fair question. It's, it's the concern that we have uncertainty put upon uncertainty. So a question around accuracy and about to engage in a fiscal system and a fiscal change at a point of expected turbulence if there is indeed a Brexit. So the, the economic consensus is there will be an impact uh, on, do, on different sectors and including on different areas. And you would expect on patterns of consumption as well, because this is, of course, a, a consumption tax, uh, if you like, um, it will have that impact. So it's the potential differential between the two, the estimates between the two. And as we've discussed at great length, because of the um, different operation of the uh, OBR and the, um, the Fiscal Commission, Scottish Fiscal Commission, then there are issues about... Um, the different analysis then driving the number that we are beholden to. So I think it's the level of risk. And what's unknown is, yes, the potential divergence between the economy in Scotland, the economy in England, consumption, and then VAT and the interpretation of it. So I think it's the uncertainty piled upon the uncertainty and making this shift at such a point of volatil volatility feels ill-advised. Um, that said, who knows what the circumstances of Brexit will be? Who knows what the outcome over the next few weeks will be? The point I'm making is more time to give us um, more data and more comparative analysis of what's going on, I think, would be in our interest. And then we could see what the divergence is and then make a decision on that basis, um, which I think is a better position than it uh, feels as if going to this uh, blindfolded. OK. Um I'm going to come to, to, to Murdo in a little while, because Murdo wants, I think, in particular in questions around the devolution of VAT and, it might, and some of the challenges on that. Um, but I'm going to get James and Emma. Emma, is that a supplementary you wanted? No, it's no. the accountability issue. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come to that. So, James Kelly, please. OK, uh, thank you, convener. You correct, Cabinet Secretary, you correctly to a position where, uh, in order to have confidence in the VAT assignment process, uh, you need to have uh, estimates that are accurate and robust and that you're confident in. So just in terms of the data sources in the current model, uh, as it's been said, you know, 70% of VAT rela relates to household spending. In terms of the data sources in the current model, um, how confident are you in those? Well, I, I, think, I think that's my point, that I'm not hugely confident. We've gone as far as we can, and even boosting the sample data it doesn't give us the kind of numbers that would fill me with confidence that will absolutely, <coughs> truly reflect the um, state of the economy and the levels of uh, VAT being paid within Scotland. And bearing in mind, um, this is a £6 billion assignation. If the margin of error is you know tens of millions of pounds or even you know hundreds of millions of pounds, then that's a risk. We fundamentally would have to pay for that through the budget. So the level of risk, the margin of error, is such that it, w it could have an impact, a material impact <coughs> on the resources that we have available. I'm happy for the officials to say more about the data sets, but see, I'm not filled with confidence that they g this gives us what we need to justify the level of risk that we're carrying. Yeah, and it's also worth reflecting on it's. The volatility created by the data sources working together, the surveys working together, um, that is not a risk that uh, we should be facing. There's a, a performance risk around volatility, and that goes with all tax, and that's managed as we do within um, the levers that we have to do that. But the way that the, the surveys work together, even if there can be confidence uh, with some of the surveys, the way they work together just creates this additional uncertainty that that. Is and would to us would not appear robust or appropriate for, for how to best manage the public finances. Is, is the methodology as it stands currently are you able to express a level of error, a level of confidence in the calculation that's been made? I'm not asking you to state that level of error, but it, it, does the, the methodology contain that? It's, it's not something that we can state at the moment. It's something that's been looked into and tend to um, come up with that number which is obviously an important number. The reason why we don't have it at the moment is because um, 
there are a large number of different components that go into the model, not just the household survey. And each of those has a, an associated individual uncertainty. And so whilst we might know the associated individual uncertainty, we're looking at different methods for adding them all together. That said, broadly sort of numbers that are already in the public domain, for example, around household surveys suggest that uncertainty levels of around 2% is quite standard for a household survey. So that's the sort of ballpark that you might expect any survey-based measure to provide. Yeah, but as it stands currently, you don't have an overall figure in terms of what what the level of error might, might be, plus or minus? Not at the moment. Um, what about the position about VAT-exempt businesses? Uh, sorry. Yeah, can I just bore down on that sure. question? Because there is some a couple of paragraphs that was provided to us by our advisors and some space around this whole issue of confidence intervals. Um, and the paper produced by the Treasury and the Scottish Government um, one, uh, it said that one of the main limitations of that paper, that it didn't preside any assessment of these confidence intervals likely to be associated with the VAT estimates. And, and for context, it describes how the GERS methodology states that the, there's a 95% confidence interval, um, which means a plus or minus £223 million pounds potential in terms of the the JERS figures. So if we don't have that, even that confidence uh, interval information, though the potential for volatility and fluctu fluctuating position of VAT in the Scottish budget must be significant if we don't even know what that number is. It's a very fair point. Um, the committee may be aware that HMRC will be publishing a uh, statistical publication on VAT assignment at the end of this month, which will hopefully provide more clarity on um, statistical confidence intervals around the VAT assignment model estimates. I to interrupt you, James. I just want to make sure that was... That's a very important. valid point, convener. Um, can I just ask about VAT-exempt businesses? And we've seen some suggestion that not, that's not been properly built into the methodology. Is that the case? Um, I, I wouldn't... So I'm not quite sure. I fully understand the question. Um, so VAT-exempt VAT businesses account for around about 15% of uh, total VAT liabilities in the UK. So that is reflected in the VAT assignment model where it is estimated how much VAT liabilities is coming from these businesses and then we have an estimate within the model of how much VAT they are generating in Scotland. Uh, so in, in simple terms, yes, VAT exempt businesses have been built into the model with Scottish specific estimates in there. Uh, can I ask about sample sizes? You've said that the sample sizes have been boosted. So what are the original sizes and what have they been boosted to to try and give you more data? So the, the boost in sample size only relates to the household sector of the VAT assignment uh, methodology. It doesn't relate to uh, other areas such as VAT exempt businesses. Um, the achieved sample size for the household sector, I think, was around 725 households in financial year 2017-18. 725 households? Yes. It uh, seems quite small. Is that, is that one of the problems, that the, the samples are very small? I th I th one of the challenges with the VAT assignment household survey is that because VAT is quite a complicated tax in the sense that you charge different rates depending on the type of product, you need to ask quite detailed questions about household expenditure to understand which products they're purchasing. So in comparison to, for example, the household, Scottish Household Survey, which has a much larger sample size, that doesn't ask very detailed questions uh, around what households are spending on. So we have an unfortunate situation where, we're, when we, where we need to collect very detailed information that becomes quite burdensome, both for the households involved, but also the people collecting the data, and that limits the household size, that we, sorry, the sample size that can be achieved in these detailed surveys. And, and what's the calculation of the total number of households in Scotland that would be contributing to that? Um, so do you mean how many households in Scotland would be paying VAT would be involved yeah. in the survey? No, you've, you've said in, the, in this sample there's 725, so yes. you're obviously using that calculation and you're extrapolating that across the, the whole of Scotland, so I'm just wondering... Uh, in terms of that 725, yeah. okay. what's, it, what's it mapping on to? There, there's slightly more than 2 million households in Scotland, and I would expect that nearly all of them would pay VAT. 
is because of almost any form of household expenditure um, other than say very basic food stuffs would include some form of VAT even heating or electricity would attract VAT at the 5% rate right. so it would okay. be very difficult for a household not to spend <coughs> anything on VAT Right, okay, I repeat what I said. It yeah. seems a small sample size given the, the, the size of the population of pain for. Right, is this a supplementary, Neil? Yes, sir. Quick, okay. so just, it, is there any concern that the, the size of the cash only economy in Scotland is any higher or lower than the rest of the UK? There wouldn't be. I think it's, it, that's a, a risk which is very difficult to quantify, essentially. Um, so there's. Two aspects of the cash-only economy, I suppose. There's a question around the cash-only economy where uh, traders are below the VAT threshold and therefore are not required to pay VAT, and that is something that the model can attempt to adjust for. Then there's another aspect to the cash-only economy, which is where people are perhaps avoiding VAT, and that is something where we have very little information on and which to make a judgment of whether or not it's different in Scotland or not. Okay. Um, I'm going to cut Murdo on, but I'm very conscious of the fact we've still got a number of people who want to come in on some of the technical issues, but I don't want the matter of the potential devolution of VAT to be lost in this discussion. Uh, so Murdo had a, some questions on that. So, yeah, on you go. Thank you, Camille. Yeah, and my colleague uh, Adam Tompkins has touched on this already. And of course, you know, we know that VAT devolution is not an option now. Uh, so this is a hypothetical question post the EU, but. If, if, if that devolution was legally permissible, is it the Scottish Government's view that that is something that is practical and desirable? For reasons I think that's uh, well understood, the purpose of the Smith Commission was for the, the Parliament essentially to have you know, the powers and be responsible for the money that's raised and the money that's spent. It used to be a, just a spending Parliament, now of course we're raising our own revenues. So. Um, having the power is uh, more desirable than simply assignation. And the issue with assignation is the level of risk that we're carrying, because we can never be sure that that was a fair uh, analysis. And as I say, the Brexit situation has added to that uh, uncertainty. Um, so, of course, this Scottish Government uh, is uh, of the view that we want as much devolution as possible. That includes the uh, fiscal matters, but it has to be right and appropriate and based on the evidence. So, of course, we would be supportive of the power of devolution of VAT to Scotland. I wasn't in the Smith Commission um, deliberations, uh, but as a Scottish nationalist, na naturally we would argue for the devolution of powers. So it's more attractive to have the powers than just uh, assignation. Um, and as I say, we have tried to be helpful here. It's, uh, it's not a lack of willing. It is, it is the risk that this committee is considering. And advisers to this committee have surely identified the level of risk that we've been asked to consider as the issue here. OK, th th thank you for that. I mean, on the level of risk, of course, the level of risk in terms of devolution would be exactly the same as assignment, although I appreciate the point that there would be a greater level of accuracy around devolution. But, of course, the volatility of VAT receipts would be the same in terms of devolution as it would be in terms of any assessed survey model on assignment. Well, it's the, it's the volatility of Brexit right now that's adding to the issue of general volatility. So if you want to set that aside for the sake of this um, uh, discussion, the important point around devolution of powers is you can then push and pull the, the levers to, 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 to adapt to the policy choices. Have uh, the ability to be agile to the needs of the economy and set VAT rates that are appropriate to the circumstances to stimulate the economy as uh, appropriate and use the, um, the power as, a, as an economic uh, and social lever. But the, the issue here is, is that it's not particularly accountable or transparent or it's not able to be evidence as to what was actually raised in Scotland, and that's the difficulty. And understanding the level of risk that we're carrying, it does lead to material considerations in the budget because we'll have to provide for it if the block grant adjustment and the estimates are not to our uh, mutual satisfaction. Okay, thank you. Um, when we took evidence <coughs> on this a few weeks ago in the round table format, and we, I, I, I think it might have been me or my colleagues specifically asked about this question of devolution of VAT. I think it's fair to say there was a very negative reaction from the witnesses we had. Mm. We were very concerned about the practicality of devolution of VAT. Uh, 
because it would, firstly because it would require a very substantial additional burden on Scottish business to create a separate Scottish tax point, and also secondly because of the nature of VAT, because it is a tax that flows across boundaries, both boundaries within the UK, if we had a devolved system, but actually international boundaries. So a Scottish business might uh, purchase goods or services from a business in Manchester, for example, and might be then reclaiming VAT that's uh, uh, paid on that good or service. So how do you account for all that? So do you appreciate there are real practical challenges here and also potentially very substantial additional cost to Scottish business from, from going down that route? So that's why what I'm proposing is to discuss this further with Treasury, to look at it as part of the fiscal framework review. We've, we've agreed that we'll conduct that, allowing the Parliament a full Parliament's time of uh, the powers and the Smith Agreement, but recognising the risks that have been fairly identified that we have further discussions on this. What I think will equip us better and inform us better is uh, a number of years' evidence in this regard in terms of what the numbers produce, what the surveys show. So there will be further data released by HMRC. But if we have more information, then at least we understand the risks more fully, as opposed to signing up to something right now that might be to the detriment of the finances and the people of Scotland without being convinced about the, the levels of accuracy. So what I'm saying, what I'm minded to do, is that we should uh, have further transition, further uh, accountability around looking at those numbers and the analysis. And I say, hopefully, this uh, current Brexit uncertainty is resolved, and we're not doing it at the point of maximum volatility. So I am trying to be constructive here with Treasury. Uh, as I say, as a Scottish nationalist, it wouldn't surprise Murdo Fraser to know that I support the devolution of fiscal powers to Scotland. But I'm proposing uh, a way forward to <coughs> recognise the concerns of the committee around accuracy, um, around what other commentators have said around a consensus on the level of risk to try and find a way forward in a constructive fashion with Treasury. And it is to say, let's review this as part of the uh, uh, fiscal framework uh, review, because we'll have more data, more information, and we recognise this was only of our assignation, not a power, but the circumstances may well have changed that might precipitate the opportunity to revisit that discussion. Now, the words level of risk have come up a number of times. I think, Angela Constance, that was an area that you were particularly interested in. Yeah, I mean, I'm particularly keen to understand a bit more about what level of risk could be uh, tolerated, given that, you know, risk can only ever be minimised, it can never be uh, eliminated. Um, I'm also interested in Cabinet Secretary, following on from uh, Murdo uh, Fraser's uh, questions about, you know, we've known about some of these potential difficulties mm. for a while. Committee's certainly been looking at this for a while in terms of the layers of complexity and the problems with no outturn data, sampling size, you know, fluctuations based on sampling as opposed to uh, revenues. Um, and, it, and it seems to me that these are just, you know, the, 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 the practicalities of devolution or the, the complexities that we get into when we have partial devolution or partial assignment as opposed to the devolution of powers. So I'm also, as well as understanding about what level of risk could be tolerated, I'm interested to know more about what you're actually seeking to discuss mm -hmm. uh, with the Treasury, uh, what discussions you've had today, if you can give us a bit of a, a flavour of that. Um, and I suppose I'd be quite interested to know whether the Treasury and the UK government would um, share some of your views about the, the difficulties here, because they appear quite, you know, I mean, they're not manufactured difficulties, you know, they're not even, um, you know, okay, at the core, they're political difficulties, but, you know, when we're talking about, you know, some of this is just technical stuff that I, you would hope there could be a, a shared understanding and a shared acceptance of. Uh, convener, that those are um, very appropriate questions. In terms of other views, not just the Scottish Government, I'm very mindful that Fraser of Allender Institute um, said late on last year that implementing a policy that exposes the Scottish budget with unnecessary risk simply to increase the impression of accountability is not a good way forward. It, they then went on to say on the 6th of December, a key aim of the Smith Commission was to improve accountability and make Scotland's politicians responsible for the money that they spend. Unfortunately, rather than helping to deliver their same, the current proposals for VAT assignment risk undermining that principle. So that's the view 
of independent economists in terms of uh, what's been agreed. Um, officials have been working together, uh, but it requires political sign-off at the Joint Exchequer Committee, so that's between the Treasury and the Scottish Government. Um, and as that work has been built up in terms of the methodology, I think I've been quite open with committee that we were building up that work, we were engaging in it constructively to see what it would produce. And what it produces for me is an unlevel of risk that Jonathan Sewell will just come back to um, in a moment in terms of that level of risk. So level of risk because of the uh, lack of outturn data and because of the question around accuracy and because of the Brexit volatility into the, to the bargain. In terms of then raising this, as I've been briefed by civil servants and the work that's been going on in anticipation uh, of potential sign-off with the Joint Exchequer uh, Committee. I have raised it with uh, Liz Truss, the uh, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, both in writing and in person, to say I am concerned about this, uh, the, the, the level of risk that they would be carrying and the material impact that I would have on the Scottish budget. So I've raised that in writing and in a person uh, most recently at my last meeting with um, the uh, Chief Secretary and I propose to do so again when I think we have a, a further meeting of Finance Minister's Quadrilateral which is intended uh, the next meeting will be in Scotland with a date yet to be confirmed. So I have been raising these issues uh, with Treasury uh, when I've become concerned by them and we haven't got that agreement to take to Joint Exchequer Committee. Can I ask Jonathan Sewell to cover the level of risk from the civil service point of view? Yeah, um, as the Cabinet Secretary says, there's, a, there's an area of risks. Uh, some are potentially more measurable than others. Uh, what uh, a lot of work has been going on is, is trying to identify and, and measure those areas where we can, but unfortunately there's, there's quite a lag on some of the data. Um, so there's a problem there. Uh, again, as we mentioned, there will be some additional data um, produced by HMRC at the end of the month. That should help us a bit further. Um, but again, one of the problems, be because of the various different areas of risk and the different abilities to measure them, it it's hard to come up with an overall risk figure for it in terms of quantifying it. Um, more how we're thinking about it is that an appropriate level of risk should be that proportionate with the ability to manage it. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to, <coughs> to work through at the moment to gain an understanding of it. Um, as we said previously, there is volatility with, with any tax receipts. That, 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 that's part and parcel of it. Some taxes are more volatile, some are less, and, and, and that's not a terrible one for that. Um, but what we have with this process is that we're exposed to the, the risk around, um, the risk that is generated by the, the survey approach. Um, and, and that is again more difficult to handle um, because it's effectively not based on real performance um, and, and and so uh, well it's hard to measure and it's hard to to address as well uh, so again we're, we're doing our best we can to try and find this out um, you're right we've been looking at it for a while but one of the problems uh, across pretty much all the fiscal devolution is that there just tends to be lags associated with the data um, and so, especially with that assignment, when we're talking about £6 billion, it, it, it's a very substantial figure. Uh, and so, uh, in our minds, it, it's probably best to, to have that time to understand it and not expose the, um, the budget to a significant risk. And, and convener, the final part of uh, Ms Constance's question was what I'm asking Treasury to do about it, <coughs> which is essentially that 1920 was to be the transitional year for implementation in 2020-21. I'm saying because of all the... Um, issues hopefully that have been well aired uh, this morning that I think we should have further discussions. I think we should look at uh, extending that transition because if we had more uh, of an understanding around the model, we would know what the numbers would tell us. We'll have that hopefully um, EU exit certainty in terms of what's happening. So the government's position on, on, on Brexit and where Scotland lies within that's well understood. For all of those reasons, we want to uh, be in a much stronger position to understand all of that before it impacts on the Scottish budget. And because of that timeline of the fiscal framework review, it does feel timely to discuss it again <coughs> at that point. And that's what I'm asking Treasury to do rather than uh, proceeding with this level of risk. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, a question really on, on, on cost. I just wondered if a Cabinet Secretary could let us know how much uh, what the cost has been of calculating 
uh, Simon exercise to date, and I appreciate some of those will be, uh, be a one-off cost in the first couple of years. So really, how much is it, would, it, would this exercise be costing annually? Uh, and more importantly, how related is that cost to the accuracy of the figures produced? So if, if as you mentioned, you know, 700, we're only doing 725 houses, how many houses do need to be done uh, to actually improve the accuracy figure? So the cost of this is a million pounds in total. Scottish Government pays half of it. Um, of course, the sum that we are assessing here is around £6 billion, so you'll understand why the level of accuracy and level of risk that we are looking at here is significant. So, so really the question is how, how much would, you know, what's the relationship between spending that money and the accuracy, and how many more houses do you have to do to improve the accuracy? What, what kind of assessment has gone into that exercise? I think, I think um, so. We, we could <coughs> survey more people, but it's the issue on estimate on estimate that, that's never resolved on a model that's yet untested. So I think that's the principal issue here. So we could pay more money, f we could you know, pay more for more surveys, but it won't address the issue. It's survey on survey, no outturn, no reconciliation, a volatile period without having tried the model. So I don't, I don't think officials would say there's any amount that you would spend that resolves those issues. No, you could make marginal improvements, but you still wouldn't get to the overall accuracy. Is the yep. cabinet secretary? Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, convener. Just, just on that whole ninety-five percent confidence interval issue, if you don't mind, just clarifying for me: Are we saying that we can't work out a figure that gives us that ninety-five percent confidence, or is it so far below that it's just too risky to proceed? Uh, bear in mind, it's, um, I think it's a good question, convener, but uh, when you're talking about the assignation of £6 billion, the level of accuracy is really important. So if there's a material impact on tens of millions of pounds on the Scottish budget, that's significant, um, because that would be tens of millions of pounds that I would don't have to spend or would have to find elsewhere. So there is a concern about... So, so what level of tolerance would the committee accept we would be wrong by? And we would ask the people of Scotland to, um, to carry, um, maybe unfairly, um, so it's the six billion pound figures is the assignation, um, and uh, even that tiny uh, margin of error on both sides of the calculation could lead to uh, an actual out a figure, an outcome uh, would be materially significant to the budget. Is there, is there, would there be any merit in, in trying to get some kind of agreement about a ceiling and a floor variation, uh, so that? So that no matter the scary figures that you get, there, there is an agreement that it won't go above or below a certain... Convener, again, that's a, that's a good point and a good suggestion. So if, you know, committee shares the view around the level of risk, as others have done, that's, mm. you know, what I would be minded to suggest to Treasury. Now, Treasury might come back and say, well, here is a mechanism that resolves your concerns. They haven't mm. so far. Okay. Uh, maybe they could put in transitional arrangements so there's no financial detriment. So maybe there are things that the UK government could propose that I would be open to, uh, such as you know no um, financial detriment, recognising that we c we can't push and pull levers here to fix the VAT issue. So if the UK government wants to respond with some sort of um, protection or um, mitigation, then of course I'd engage constructively with that. But my point right now is, um, short of that, not implementing until we have more data and a deeper understanding of what the model produces, it feels like the right thing to do. But it's a good question, and if Treasury wished to bring, form, uh, bring forward some form of mitigation as their transitional arrangement, uh, maybe that would be very helpful and we could consider that. And I would, of course, bring that back to the committee, uh, convener. You know, the Fiscal Commission will have to build in its VAT <coughs> forecasts for future budgets, Derek, and uh, I imagine it's important that the figures that they use then are at least sort of reliable, that they, they can be used. You know? uh, well, yes, uh, again, the <laughs> Fiscal Commission's uh, forecasts are absolutely significant generally in the whole um, BGA and um, uh, reconciliation. And you'll be bound by that, won't you? Uh, we, are, mm. we are bound by those arrangements, yes, yep. in terms of the Fiscal Commission forecasts, yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. As a fiscal commission, have you, what discussions have you had? This must be, trying to estimate this, must be terrifying them. For want of a better description. I, I so think what, discussions, <laughs> what discussions have you had with them? I, I'm, I'm happy to ask uh, officials to um, declare the level of terror within the fiscal commission. <laughs> um, 
I think they're enjoying the role, but they recognise, as, as committee is well aware, that uh, at least where we have outturn data, then there becomes a, a moment of truth, a point which we can reconcile figures that were based on estimates. The difficulty here is you never quite get to that. And Jonathan can cover the um, engagement with the uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission. Yeah, uh, we have engaged with uh, the Fiscal Commission. I thought you could, yeah, they're terrified. I thought you were going to say. I, I, I couldn't possibly comment on their level <laughs> of terror. Uh, they, would, they would have to offer that. Um, but yeah, um, we've engaged with them uh, regularly on this matter. Uh, the SOC have also been engaging with HMRC on it. Um, again, it would be for SFC to, to comment on this more, but um, they agreed that it was with some of the same challenges we faced in terms of uh, interpreting the data. Um, okay. Emma? Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I'm interested in issues around accountability in Cabinet Secretary. You've just described words ar ar around who's accountable. Um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission is responsible for forecasts and receipts assigned to the Scottish Budget. The OBR is in charge of producing forecasts of VAT for the UK as a whole, but the UK Government and the Scotch, Go Scottish Government have jointly developed this methodology. And we've just heard lots of words about risk and data and boosted data and, and accuracy. So who's accountable? It, well, I'm accountable as Scotland's Finance Secretary to Parliament. And I think that's partly why I'm expressing to committee that I'm not convinced with the level of risk that we'd be carrying. So I'm accountable for what we sign up to in the uh, Joint Exchequer Committee, and then I'm accountable for Scotland's budgets. Uh, there's methods of accountability for SFC, of course, to the uh, Parliament, and they publish their forecasts, and uh, they're accountable to you, uh, convener, and all committee members when they appear before you and you challenge them on uh, their evidence. We do so uh, in a constructive way, as you would expect, not to change forecasts, but through a constructive challenge uh, as well. So there are various strands of accountability and how all the different institutions work and how we operate. And I think I've been very open and transparent with this committee that some of the concerns that you and others have been raising, I share in terms of the level of risk. And for the reasons I've explained, that hasn't been uh, resolved, and that's what's uh, leading me to the to the approach. I think we should engage further with Treasury. And again, you, just to reiterate, the uncertainty, the instability, the issues around Brexit is uh, is that just another another issue in the whole mix of things, which is leading to a proposed delay in this process until we've got. I guess, better data? Yes, Convener, this is the transitional year. We'll have one year of a, a, the, the data. If it was implemented in 2020-21, I, I think that the timing is just absolutely not right for all the reasons that I've given, um, and therefore I think we require uh, further time. So uh, for all the reasons I've given at committee, yes, I think we, we need more time and engagement with Treasury to, to try and resolve this. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. The you introduced the issue of transparency. I know Tom was also interested in transparency and public confidence in this process, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. This is clearly a very complicated matter, um, but fundamental um, to the whole Smith process and the Scotland Act was about increasing the accountability of this parliament. Now, given the challenges that we face in wrestling with this and the challenges around transparency, do you think that raises broader issues about democratic accountability and ensuring that the public do have that understanding, given the existing complexities of the fiscal framework? It, it, clearly, the fiscal framework is incredibly uh, complex. Um, it, when we come to outturn figures, actual published mm. outturn figures on income tax, for example, at least we will know exactly what tax was paid and then we can do the reconciliation with the forecasts that were made that we were bound by. The difficulty here is we will never have that outturn. We will never know in the real world what tax was actually collected in Scotland. And it's my concern around level of risk, volatility, uncertainty, and not being convinced by the robustness of the model. So we could give the model more time to run before we make a decision on its um, uh, appropriateness. And again, my point is timing here. We could be, you know, what might be a major shock in the economy if an ideal Brexit goes ahead or if Brexit goes ahead, that shock in the economy is the worst possible time to engage in this estimate process. It will never have a reconciliation, but could, in fact, if the figures are not in our favour, mean that we have to make decisions in a budget that will be a material impact on Scotland's budget and the decisions we make as a parliament. So I don't think that complexity will help accountability or transparency in that regard. 
And just a, a very final question, Cabinet Secretary, just to ensure maximum um, transparency. I noticed that a, a member of this committee during the proceedings tweeted suggesting that VAT was a power. I wonder if you can just confirm absolutely once and for all that VAT is not a power being devolved to the Scottish Parliament as a signation, just to avoid any doubt. Convener, I've been paying so much attention to the questions from members. I've not been engaged in Twitter whilst I've been giving evidence at committee. But if someone has tweeted this is a power, not assignation, this is assignation uh, of a tax based on estimates. It's not a power. We have no power over VAT in Scotland. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, um, I don't know what to say to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have an investigation. <laughs> that's, that's what we'll do. Have an inquiry. <laughs> um, find a, find a Twitter, I, Twitter. Can I, can I um, just get back to, I want to just understand some of the landscape of the discussions between yourself, Treasury and HMRC, because I think from the fiscal framework document, it suggests that the discussions are between Treasury, sorry, between HMRC <coughs> and the Scottish Government, then go through the GEC. Now, I don't want to make a a, a, a difference in the Treasury and HMRC, but wh who is it actually the HMRC you're dealing with on this issue, or is it the Treasury? It's Treasury, treasury in terms direct. of the politics and the agreement. It might help us in terms yeah. of if we decide to take further evidence, it's probably more appropriate on that occasion. Na if we naturally, to do that. Yeah, naturally, convener, um, uh, HMRC would inform Treasury in the way that Revenue Scotland would, would inform Scottish Government. Okay. That's helpful. Right, okay, thank you very again, very much again to our witnesses, particularly the Cabinet Secretary. We've been here for almost two hours now. Um, and uh, our members for their questions. That concludes the public session of the Financial Constitution Committee this morning. Thank you.